Lord God, we thank you for the cross of Jesus Christ, that he paid our debt, that he gave his life. We love him, Lord, because he first loved us. He did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And we are part of that many. Jesus has shown us a better way, a better life. Through his life, we enter in to the way of God. And that's why we've gathered, Lord. We're, we're not here for attention or accolades. We're not here uh, to be seen by others, to be anything other than who we are. We're not uh, here, Lord, for any other reason except for you except to experience your presence, to be healed of our brokenness, to have our burdens lifted off of us, to be comforted in our mourning. Lord, we have gathered here for you, to bless you. In turn, Lord, may you pour out your life on us anew. May your spirit stir and give us peace. Pray and ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, the one who gives us life. Amen and amen. You know, I was reminded as we were uh, singing that last song, Jesus, We Love You, a song so simple yet so profound. One of the great treats I get from time to time is to hear all of you sing. And so I was behind the curtain over there and I saw Jonah kind of step back and your voices just lifted up onto the stage. It was, uh, it was magnificent, quite frankly, uh, something that's very powerful. There's something when we lift our voices in song that almost seems to suspend time and take us into a place where we encounter God in the new in a fresh way. So I encourage you, when you sing, you may think, oh, I don't know the song, or I'm not sure about it, or, you know, I can't carry a tune. Uh, just lift your voices anyway. Uh, it blesses people around you. It, I think it blesses the Lord to hear us lift our voices in song. If you have your Bible, if you turn it on, uh, or you can use an old school one like mine, or we have the scripture will be up on the screen. We're continuing our sermon series, Foundations of Faith. We've kind of skipped over uh, uh, Esau and Jacob and moved right into Yosef or uh, Joseph. And we're going to be examining his life in a different way maybe than you are accustomed to hearing. How many of you have heard the story, parts of the story a little bit of the life of Joseph? Anybody? All right, thank you. Five of you. Thanks. That's awesome. Um, yeah, we've heard it. We've heard different stories. We've heard it in uh, Sunday school, VBS, and church, or uh, we've maybe talked about it in our homes. We've heard that. How many of you have heard the hero, uh, Joseph, who, who was falsely accused, not once but twice, who was uh, thrown into uh, jail, and God delivered him and made him uh, powerful in Egypt and, and just helped save them? How many of you all have heard that story? Yeah, a little bit different maybe than what the text actually says. So we're going to read that, a little bit of that this morning. This text goes from chapter 37 all the way to 50, but we're not going to read all of that. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about it, but in 37, 1 through 11, uh, follow along. It says, Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. And this is the account of Jacob. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age, and he made a richly ornamented robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they really loved him. 
they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brother said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream, and he, sold it to, and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun and moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Interesting story, right? The last of the patriarchs, uh, the one who will take us from 37 all the way to the end of Genesis, right before Moses and the Exodus. And right away, you can tell things are not well in this family. Now remember, God made a covenant we talked about with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and now it falls to Joseph. But with Abraham, he had said, I'm going to bless you, and through you, I'm going to bless many nations and all nations. That was the promise that he made. I'm making a covenant. I'm attaching myself to you and to your descendants. And I will always be with you. And remember, God passes through the, the covenant blood, but forbids Abraham from doing that, thus tying himself to Abraham to fulfill all the requirements of covenant, but keeping Abraham and his descendants from being tied to their end of it, lest they sin or break the covenant and forfeit their lives. And so God has said, I'm going to be faithful to you and your line for all time. Not just until we get to the fifth or sixth generation, but for all time, I'm going to be faithful to you. And that comes with a requirement or a responsibility. You are to be a generous, hospitable people that reveal the life of God to everyone you come in contact with. In fact, your life is to be a blessing to the nations. People ought to be better because they know you. That's the life that you are responsible for living under the terms of our covenant. And so it seems to be going well. Abraham is someone who trusts God implicitly. He's human. He makes mistakes. He fails, but he learns quickly. And he trusts God, even willing to offer his only son, Isaac. God stays his hand, and then God says, Now I know that there is nothing that Abraham will not do powerful moment and picture. Abraham has this incredible trust in God. And then Isaac seems to do the same. He has an incredible trust in God, a child of the promise, born in old age to Abraham and Sarai. I joked last week that Abraham, when he left Ur of the Chaldees, was the same age as Michael Panini, 75 years old. Travel all that distance. And, and so it seems to be going well, but then Isaac has two sons. And if you remember, uh, Rebecca gives birth to one son who comes out clutching the heel of the other one. And the older son, Esau, uh, is not interested in his responsibilities, is not interested in, in the covenant and what it means. He would rather be out hunting. He would rather be out doing things uh, outdoors and in the world. He doesn't have time, doesn't want to take the responsibility. But Jacob understands it. And he understands the importance of it and the value of it. And so he begins to fight for the birthright. And he, he gets the birthright and he gets the blessing on top of that. And he makes this enemy. And Rebecca says, you have to get out of here because your brother's coming. And he doesn't want to talk. And so Jacob leaves. 
and is subjected to the same deception that he put upon Esau. He goes to uh, his uncle's household, to that family, to that bait of. We talked about the, the house of the father, the bait of. And all that that requires, that that house has everything for life. All of your, uh, everything is provided for you. The patriarch takes care of your living. They're responsible to do so, to take care of your maladies, to give you the food that you eat and the clothes that you have. And that house could be rather large. And so he leaves and he runs to his uncle Laban's house. And there he finds a beautiful young woman and, and, and he works seven years for the right to marry her, only to find out uh, on their wedding night that it's her sister, that he has been deceived. So he works another seven years and then gets the wife that he had chosen originally. He leaves and is pursued by his uncle because something had been taken that Jacob didn't realize his wife had actually taken it. It's Messed up. Then he has to travel all the way back not knowing if Esau is going to kill him or greet him or the family seems to have taken a turn. The, the name Jacob means supplanter or deceiver. And he seems to have lived into his name, but then he meets God. And he becomes not Yaakov, but Yisrael, which means he who contends with God and overcomes. An incredible moment. And now Jacob has married. He's married Rachel and Leah, but he's, but he's also married uh, two other ladies who have borne him sons, 11 sons. And that's where the story lands. These 11 sons are out doing their father's bidding, and, and Joseph is the favorite of the family. And, and Jacob makes no pretense about it. As the, as the patriarch and the Badoff, he gives all of them clothing, but he gives an extra coat to Joseph. He, it's very clear that he's favored. And so his older sons hated him. This isn't so much a question of jealousy, it is that, but it also has to do with inheritance. You see, in the ancient world, in this culture, in, in this Jewish family and many other families in the ancient world, there was the right of the firstborn, the Bechor, the, the one who is the firstling. And what's given is, if you have five sons, let's say, then you divide out six portions and the oldest gets a double portion. And the reason is they become the new patriarch and they have to have twice as much resources to be able to take care of the family. That's their responsibility. And so Reuben, who's the oldest, wants that responsibility, but it's, it's very clear that the favored wife is going to, uh, her son is going to get the position and the status and is going to become the firstborn from Rachel and the Bechor for the whole family. So they're not happy. It, it, it's not the Brady Bunch. It's not the Partridge family. They're not singing together by the campfire. It's just not happening. There is friction. There is tension three times. Three times from verses 1 to 11, it says they hated him. Three times the author wants to make the point of what's happening in the family. It seems like Jacob's sins have come back on him. So then, in this text, we see that, that Joseph has the common sense, or lack thereof in this case, to tell him about a dream. He can't pay attention and read the room. He tells them about this dream where they all serve him. Uh, he is the poster child, if you will, of entitlement. What are you going to do? Dad has my back. You don't dare go against him. So he talks to them this way. Then he talks to his, his mother and father. He doesn't understand that even though this dream may be appropriate and may come to pass, in the family dynamic, it's maybe not the best time to bring this up. Maybe save that and put it on the back shelf until such time as that comes to pass. But he doesn't do that, and so they hate him. So what happens 
Next is that they go out into the field. They, they take their father's flocks a great distance away. And, and Joseph is sent again. Remember Tattletale Joseph who gave a bad report? Is sent again to go to his brothers to find out what they're doing. He goes one place and doesn't find them and, in, and goes to a second place and finds them there. And as he's coming up, as he's walking from a distance, they see him and they're so excited to see him. They're so happy. We love our brother. He's wonderful. He's gracious, except it's the furthest thing from that. They see him and they start plotting to kill him. How much hatred has to exist in a family? That you hate someone so much that you seek to end their life. Think about that. I wonder if at this point in the story God is going, well maybe I picked the wrong family. This doesn't seem to be working out too well. This is not what I had in mind. But God still remains faithful to them. So he goes out, he comes up to them, uh, they're getting ready to kill him, and Reuben speaks up and says, we can't do that, we can't do that. If you have to do something to him, throw him down this empty cistern until we can figure out what we're going to do. And so that's what they do. They throw him down the cistern, uh, Reuben steps away for a period of time, and when he comes back, Joseph is gone, because as they ate their meal, they saw a caravan of merchants, and they sell their brother, they strip him of that cloak, the the idea of his favor, and they sell him away to be taken to another land. And then Reuben comes back and says, the cistern's empty. What have you done with him? Well, we sold him. Uh, what are we going to tell our father? Reuben is the oldest, the spokesperson, the one who is the Bahor, who is supposed to go and, and, and be responsible for the group. What am I going to tell them now? And so they slaughter a goat. They wipe his cloak in the blood. And then, of course, you know the story. They tell him a wild animal has gotten him. And Jacob is absolutely heartbroken as he goes into captivity. So 37 gives us that picture, but it's not done yet because then in 38 there is a wild turn. There is a story there that does not belong there. So this is supposed to be the story of Joseph, right? 37 through 50 is supposed to be all about Joseph. But in 38 it says, now Judah, who's one of the brothers, he was the one who raised his hand and said, let's kill him. That's Judah. Judah has a separate story now. He's away from the family. The text doesn't tell us, but imagine why. He's the one that was the ringleader for taking Joseph's life. There, there must have been a fight and contention, and now he's away from the family. And this is the story of his life. And, and he goes and he has a family, and he, he begins to, to live his life separate from his family's life. So we know something is very wrong. The story goes on in 38. Uh, I won't get in too complicated, but there's a moment in 38 where his daughter-in-law comes to him under disguise in deception and says, uh, says that you have not found me a husband and, uh, and there is some responsibility there from the ancient world. Well, let me just back up and tell you part of the story, but I'm going to edit it since we have little ears. So... So Judah is very driven. He's very, his name means justice. He feels cheated. He feels like something has been done to him that is not right. And he can't stand it, nor can his brothers. And he goes away and he starts his family. And, and one of his sons passes, leaving his daughter-in-law. And under the, the ancient customs of that day, if your brother's wife passes, you have a responsibility to become her husband so that your brother's name will continue to live on, so that it's not wiped out from the earth. I know it's barbaric for us. We can't understand that. But it's the idea of keeping that lineage alive. And so what happens is Judah will not permit one of his other sons to marry her, shamed her. Well, it just so happens that she dressed up, as we say in the town, as a lady of the night, shall we say. And he happens to be coming by there, and he asks her to come in with him. And she does. And she says, I'm not, because she's not a fool, she says, I need a pledge. 
And he said, well, I have a young goat that I will give to you. And she said, well, well where is it? I don't have it with me. And so, so she says, then you're going to need to leave something. And so he leaves her his cloak and his staff and his seal. Fast forward to she comes to him later out of the disguise. They, Judah tries to make it right. He tries, sends his servant with the goat, but can't find her anywhere. Comes back. And she comes to him and says that, that she uh, has still been wronged. And then the word is reported to her that, that she has gone out and been a lady of the night and is now pregnant with someone else's child. See, this is, I'm telling you, you don't need to go to Hollywood. <laughs> this is crazy stuff. And so he says, well, bring her out. She's going to be burned. And she goes, oh, do you recognize these? It's interesting that word used there, the same word that is used in 37 when they bring the cloak of Joseph to his father and say, do you recognize these? That same word in a parallel passage in a very similar set of circumstances, that word is nakar in the Hebrew. And that word means to recognize, to see something for what it is. Important word to hang on to in this. It seems that all of the issues that Jacob has brought about have now found their way back into his family. Maybe that's what the scripture is talking about, that, that the curse of iniquity is on the third and fourth generation. Maybe it has nothing to do with God actively putting that. Maybe it's a learned behavior that has been observed by our children. That makes sense, right? Our children are our first disciples. They're the ones who, who act as we do, who, who do things like we do, who have our same mannerisms. And sometimes it's told to parents, oh my gosh, your son or your daughter, they act just like you and we all cringe, you know, a little bit. Oh, that's not good. And then our children are really cringe because they don't want to be associated with us. That's... The picture. And if you don't think you do that, has anybody ever been correcting your children and you start to say things and then you realize, oh my gosh, I sound like my mom or I sound like my dad. Maybe it's just a learned thing that is the story has found its way. They have now reaping what they have sown so long ago. And Judah's life. Is it now has this. And then it moves into Joseph in captivity. He's taken to the house of Potiphar. Potiphar in the Hebrew, he's, he's taken there and he quickly becomes the head of the house. Everything is put in charge. Uh, he, he's, he's over all of it. He is second only to his master so much so that all Potiphar has to do is just eat. He doesn't worry about anything else because Joseph has it well in hand. And even in the moment of seduction, uh, similar to 38, by the way, another parallel. The moment of seduction when Potiphar's wife comes in and invites him in as Judah invited the daughter-in-law in unknowingly. Joseph, remember he's the hero, the one that we talk about unfairly treated. Uh, that ego is still alive in him. And he says to her, how can I do this? I'm the master of all this house. My, my master doesn't worry about anything. I, I look at all that I'm in charge of. He doesn't worry because I'm here. There's still a little bit of that entitled ego that remains in him. Of course, you know the story. She grabs his cloak. Cloaks are very interesting. They pop up multiple times in Joseph's story. She takes his cloak. She lies about him. He's thrown into prison. While in prison, he meets two royal officials, uh, the cupbearer for the king and the baker, and they have dreams. And they, they come to him and they tell him what those dreams are. And Joseph says, only God can, can interpret dreams. But then that ego is still there. But tell me your dream and I will interpret it for you. So they do, and he interprets it. And, and then that ego's still there because 
He tells the cupbearer, when you go into Pharaoh's court, remember me. Put in a good word. Hey, drop my name. I could use a position. Still, it still has a ways to die. And then, of course, you know the rest of the story. Eventually, Pharaoh has a dream. He has a, a dream of, of two kinds that mean the same thing. They bring Joseph in, and Joseph says something different this time. He says, only God can interpret dreams. And Pharaoh just starts to tell him the dream. He doesn't step in quickly on the front end. Men to interpret the dream, and the dream is, of course, about uh, agriculture and about uh, livestock. The first one is that there are uh, there is a seven years of a crop that are uh, abundant, or there's an abundant crop, seven stalks of it, and then there's uh, followed by a withered crop of seven stalks, and those seven stalks eat up the healthy stalks so that they're not even remembered that there was healthy stalks or sheaves. And then the second is of, of seven healthy, sleek cattle that are, that are a, to signify abundance, obviously, and then seven sickly cattle that eat up the healthy ones so much so that they don't gain any weight from eating them. And so there's no remembrance of those healthy cattle. And Joseph immediately steps in and says, I know the answer to this. And then he tells him, of course. But what's so powerful about this story is that word, Nakar, recognize. Something happens in Joseph's life in that moment uh, that he's able to interpret so quickly. He doesn't have to pray. He doesn't have to do anything. It, it, it's as if he already knows the answer. The reason for that is the rabbis talk about a key that he possessed to unlock those dreams. It's in a midrash, which is a Jewish interpretation. And what they say is that Joseph's own life helped him to unlock this. How many years did Jacob have to work for Laban? How many? The first time, seven. How many years did he have to work for the second wife? Seven. Only this time, what's so interesting in the text about this and what makes the scripture so amazing is the story works in reverse. It's like, you've heard the story, that if, you, uh, if you play a country and western album backwards, the guy gets his car and his wife and his dog back. You've heard that? It's the same thing, except the author is doing that in particular. It's a device to tell us what's happening here, a literary device. And so what he says is that, that these years that have been taken away, the, the first seven he was tricked, and then the second seven he gets this time, it works quite the opposite. And it unlocks that particular dream that he has. He understands, and it unlocks it with his own life. Can you imagine that moment when that happened? That, that he knew the answer, but then he started thinking, oh my gosh, where am I? What's happened in our family? How did, I, how did I get to this place? It's a moment where the light comes on. I wonder after all the festivities and, and when he's given the robe and all the power and authority, if he's not sitting Wondering about his life. Where have we been? How did we get to this point? Who have I become? How arrogant have I become? He sees all the way back. And God, in giving him the interpretation, unlocks the thing that he has to deal with. It happens all the time with us. I don't know if you've ever had an experience like that where, where God has so spoken to you that the Spirit of God has so quickened you that in a moment where you experience the presence and the power of Christ, you look back over your life and you see it and you realize that the future is unlocked by the past dealing with it. Not letting it go. Psychologists will tell you that the key to moving on past the issues of life is to dealing with them and not pushing them down 
but making your peace with them, recognizing that something has happened. There are moments like that in our lives. There, there, there's a moment like that in my life, in your life. I remember it clearly. Remember, in eighth grade, feeling the call of God on my life by myself in a youth room, praying and asking God what he wants to do with my life. It happens in this church. There are two people sitting here among you, probably among many, who have had just that kind of moment. And I talked to them before the service and asked if it was okay if I share their story. It's a story of Nakar, of, of recognizing something happening. Uh, the first, this young man is married to a young lady who was in my youth group. And he came here and didn't know who we were. And I don't blame him, he was a little wary of us trying to figure all that out and understand. And, and, and he didn't grow up in church. His family didn't take him to church. There wasn't religion or, or any type of faith active in that home. And, and, and through his wife began to get introduced to us and began to kind of see the community that's here. And, and it all clicked together at the wild game dinner when he saw the community that exists in mission, moving to do something for our community. And in that moment, Nakar, he recognized, my words, not his. He recognized, he recognized that God was at work in his life. And I'll never forget, right over there by that camera, one Sunday, he came up to me, giddy, excited, almost shaking. And he said, it's time. And I thought, did I miss something? Are we short of what? And I was like, what, what do you mean? He said, it's time. I want to be a part of this. And I said, what do you mean by that? No, I said, Are you, you want to follow Christ? Yes, whatever you call it, I want in. And I said, what is it? Because I saw the community among the men at the wild game dinner. And I want to be a part of that. And so we baptized Dakota. That's right. He had a moment of recognition. Something happened. It wasn't manufactured. It wasn't we were handing him cards. Okay, look for these things. It just happened. He was paying attention to what was going on around him. and Something happened. But he's not alone. There's another young man here. Uh, his story is crazy. I'm just going to tell you. Uh, this young man uh, lives in the neighborhood next year, and he, he was with his friends, and, and, and they were up to what kids who were riding around on their bicycles normally do. No good. Okay, getting into trouble, mischievous. Uh, I've been there too. And, and through all of that, destroyed some of the property here. But that's not where the story ends. Uh, his dad, amazingly, uh, said no. And I mean this in our culture. Said, no, you're going to pay for that. And I'm not going to pay for it. You're going to pay for it. And so he worked it off. And we thought, I mean, who'd want to come to the church after that? <laughs> I wouldn't. I'd be running. And suddenly he appeared in our youth group. And they just kept coming. And then he kept coming. And then he kept coming. And, and, and then he became kind of one of the core people here. And, and people loved him and brought him in. And, and he found life here. And he said, I, I want to be baptized. I remember sitting in the confirmation class doing the interviews. I interview all of them. I remember talking to him. And I said, do you realize how far the Lord has brought you? And he looked at me dead in the eye. He said, yes, sir, I do. And we baptized Stephen. And let me tell you what's funny is if there's an event up here, Stephen is here. And, and I, I think he probably tells his parents, look, I'm going. I don't know what y'all are doing. But he, he just is here at everything we do. If it's like, well, we're going to all meet up here and then we're going to drive over there. He'll just show up. Hey, I just want to wish y'all well. Have a nice day. And then, because he wants to be here. Why? Because there's community. There's a place to belong. That, that's, 
that's what Nakar is. It's, a, it's an opening of our eyes that the Spirit of God does. And we see that the answer and the way forward is by dealing with the things in the past. And God in Joseph did something so powerful in him that the answer to Pharaoh's question was held in his life. Coming to terms with what happened. And not only was he blessed, this is the power of this story, but the nation was saved. Now, was he all the way redeemed? No, he still kind of said, after Pharaoh said, well, what should we do? And he said, well, Pharaoh, you need to look for a guy who's wise enough to, uh, to maybe help you. But still God used that to be able to save. And, and the story of God went through his life. He became, he fulfilled what God said to Abraham, a blessing to the nations. And that is our story. Our story is, no, maybe we haven't been imprisoned or falsely accused or all of those sorts of things. Maybe that hasn't happened that, to us. But there's a moment where we recognize what God is doing, where we see the river and it's time to get in, not to stand on the sidelines. And part of that is dealing with the issues that we have not dealt with. And that becomes the key to moving forward. In the story of God, through us, some of us don't think that God can do anything through us. We think that the ends of that are, hey, look, I'm just simply here and that's enough. No, God is inviting you to get in the river, to be a part of his story, for it to carry you and through you to bless other people. That is the point of Joseph's life to you and I. That's what you're called to do, to recognize. But in order to do that, you have to pay attention to life and what's going on around you. And I know it's hard because you have four kids and they're in five things. You have one kid and they're in four things. It, it, you, you have vacations and you have your work life and you have all of these different clubs that you're in and all that sort of stuff, I understand. But when was the last time you stepped back and looked at your life? When did God come calling and you just sat back and responded instead of, I can't deal with that right now, or I, I can't do that. I have these four things. I, I understand. This morning I was praying, uh, as is my custom, before all the services begin, and I, I was just sitting there quietly, and all of a sudden, you need to call this person. You need to email this. Do this right now, because you'll forget. I know you. You'll forget. So write it down. Stop praying. And I just had to shut all that stuff out to be able to sit before the Lord. So it, it can be done, and there's grace for the journey, but we have to be willing to get in and to look at our lives. And I think if we do that, we'll discover that God is up to something that we can't possibly imagine. The story of Joseph is that recognition, Nakar, is redemption. It leads there. And there are two guys here who can tell you all about it because of the goodness of God. May we be those people in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Do you recognize what the Lord is doing in your life and through your life? Pay attention. Look closely you will see God's story moving in and through you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.